Hey guys, welcome back. I'm Megan Campbell and this is Making Stuff. So before we get started, I'd just like to say Happy New Year's and uh, all the best for 2024. This will be my first video for the year, so uh, let's get started. So today I'm going to be trying to build a drone flute. Now if you don't know what that is, uh, don't worry, I only discovered this instrument uh, about two days ago when I saw this video. Now I'm not going to spend too much time trying to explain the ins and outs of this instrument as everything I know about it I've learned in the past two days. But basically as you can see it is a Native American flute that has basically two chambers and only the one chamber has tone holes and you can choose to either play only through the one chamber with the tone holes or if you blow through both chambers at the same time um, the second chamber only plays a single drone tone on top of whatever else you're playing which gives it a really nice harmonic rich kind of sound so as I've never done this before um, I've decided I'm going to make two of them because I've noticed that most of the people that make them um, generally use uh, softer types of wood and I was planning on using a hardwood so in this case I'm going to try um, both and see uh, which works out better so for the one I'm going to be using this um, piece of teak which is a really dense, heavy wood. And I'm gonna be making the totem out of a contrasting lighter wood, which in this case is gonna be either this piece of maple or this piece of ash over here. Now the totem is basically just a block that goes on top of the air hole at the top, which is what creates the whistle or the sound, for lack of a better term. And the second one I'm gonna be making, I'm gonna be using just a standard piece of pine and then uh, contrasting that, I'm going to be using this piece of darker wood. Um, now this is a, a local wood and it's fairly light. A little bit more dense than pine, but it's still very light. Around these parts, most people refer to it as dwarf oat um, or uh, kiat. So everything I've basically learned about uh, drone flutes and Native American flutes in general, I've learned over the past two days watching videos from Blue Bear Flutes. His name is Charlie and he has a real wealth of knowledge when it comes to uh, making and playing these instruments. He has a whole website dedicated to the crafting of these instruments as well as selling them. If you're interested in making something like this, I'd highly recommend that you go and check out his website. I'll leave all of his uh, details below. So let's get started. In order to make this, all of my wood is going to have to be milled down to 14.5mm uh, as the overall thickness of my flute is going to be 29 and as I'm cutting it in two halves and then gluing it together, um, all of the pieces are going to have to be 145 as well as the totems. Uh, the totems is going to be uh, three pieces of 14.5 glued together and that's going to make up enough width to cover the sound holes and the air holes. So let me take out the planer and let's get milling. So to make life a little bit easier on my planer I decided to run some of the pieces through the band saw just to get them roughly to the right thickness.
Okay, so the milling is done. Uh, now it's time to start doing the first cuts. Now I've already drawn up the cut files for um, all of the cuts. Usually in past videos I do show time lapses of me setting up the cut files, but I figure that's not exactly very gripping content. So um, I've skipped that step and we're going to go straight to cutting. Now the first pass that's going to be done is um, the slots which will become the inside channel of the flute. Um, now for that I'm going to be needing this uh, brand new 19 millimeter round nose um, router bit that I bought. This thing was terribly expensive so um, hopefully I can get a whole lot of use out of it. Um, now you'll see that I've clamped up my piece of pine first. The reason for that is um, I just want to see if my feeds and speeds are going to be okay. If I'm going to mess up a piece of wood I'd rather it be the piece of pine than my piece of teak. So I'm going to swap out my bit, set the origin and we can run the first cut. Okay, so I'm pretty happy I did that first test cut on the pine because judging by the horrible sound that router bit was making, um, I'm guessing that I had my depth of cut um, way too deep. I didn't think it was going to be a problem, but it definitely sounds like it is. So before I cut the next one, um, this specific tool path I'm just going to change to do in two, maybe even three passes and that should hopefully be a whole lot better. Now even though there was a whole lot of chatter and uh, horrible noise, um, the cut inside here is very smooth and nice, so I don't think uh, that is a problem at all. So before I get on to the next piece, um, I'm going to do the rest of the cuts on this one while I have it clamped up here. The first cut I'm going to do is cutting all the tone holes, the um, sound holes and the air holes, after which um, I'll cut the perimeter of each of these. Um, I'm going to be leaving um, four tabs on each of these so that it doesn't shift around um, while it's cutting. Uh, once that's done, then I'm going to have to turn one of these around, um, the one that has the air and the sound holes, and I'm going to have to line it up really carefully so that I can cut the tracks on the other side of the piece. So the rest of the cuts that I have to do on here is with the 3mm end mill, so I'm going to uh, change it out for that and get cutting. Okay, so let's discuss the elephant in the room. Uh, the reason this happened 
is because I forgot that uh, for all of the other cuts, I set the origin point to the base of the spoil board. But for this cut specific, I wanted the track to be exactly one millimeter thick. So for that reason, instead of setting the origin to the base of the spoil board, I set the origin to the top of the material and I forgot about it. Um, I only reset my origin for the X and Y, but uh, the origin for Z was still on the surface of the material. So in fact the bit wanted to cut the one millimeter slot in the top of the spoil board and not the top of the material. So that's a rookie mistake. Um, luckily I still have uh, I think uh, one or two three millimeter bits left. So I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to do with this one now. I might have to recut um, this one piece or if I can't find a suitable piece of scrap material Perhaps I'll just cut the slots in here anyway and fill this gash up with some sawdust. I think I might go that route because I made this pine one specifically to uh, test on. So at least hopefully I won't make that mistake again. Okay, so as you can see it's not a hundred percent perfect but that's pretty damn close um, it's probably like a millimeter off to the right but uh, luckily this pine is very soft uh, with a sharp blade i can just widen this hole a bit and then it should be fine i've decided i'm going to uh, keep this one that i've damaged i'm just going to uh, fill this up as i'm not going to be selling these um, it would be a nicer story to tell so now that this one's done um, let me go and redo the tool path for the slots and i can get cutting on the next So as you can see here, uh, I'm cutting the slots in three passes and initially um, it was doing okay but uh, closer to the end of this job the, the bit started screeching a lot again and in hindsight I may have had the bit sticking out uh, further than it should have been so it was creating a vibration and eventually the bit just couldn't handle it and once again Luckily there was still about two centimeters left over on the shank uh, so I took that and stuck it back in the collet as deep as I could. Thankfully the bit was way more rigid that way and I was able to finish out the cut without any further problems. So here I ran into some problems again. Um, on the previous cut with the pine, I set this perimeter cut to cut in two passes. <gasps> and it proved to be way too much for this uh, super hard teak. So using my last three millimeter bit, um, I set the tool path to cut in five passes instead of two. <gasps> and it seems like the speed was still too much. So at this point I only had a 4mm bit left so I had to recalculate all of the tool paths to work with a 4mm bit instead and thankfully I managed to finish out all the rest of the cuts without any further problems.
Okay guys, that's where I'm going to end it for today. Um, it's been a pretty expensive one for me. Um, I've broken more router bits today than I have since I got this machine. Four bits in one day uh, and one of them was really expensive. A couple of miscalculations, a couple of stupid mistakes and suddenly this project is costing me a whole lot more than I hoped it would. With that said, um, I'm pretty happy with uh, what I have so far. There's a couple of changes I'm going to have to make here and there. Some of you might have noticed the knot in the side of this teak flute, but um, I don't think that's going to be too much of a problem. Um, I added a bit of extra length because once you start tuning it, you're supposed to cut little pieces off gradually until you get to the right tune. Um, hopefully I have enough left here to do that, but uh, only time will tell. So, see you tomorrow. So yeah, I'm just using a flush trim router bit to cut off the tabs that were left over from the CNC. Okay, so it's about time to start gluing these up. But before I do that, while I still have it open, I want to do a little bit of shaping on the sound hole and the air hole. Um, I'll put a little uh, screenshot up here to show you um, a reference image that I have. It shows that uh, the inside edges of each of these holes have to have roughly a 45 degree bevel on each side. Um, this one in the air chamber um, is actually a little rounded, but the one on the flute chamber here is uh, pretty flat. Now I was planning on doing most of the shaping with a file from the outside but I'm worried that um, the hole might be a bit small and I'm not going to get a really nice 45 degree angle in there without damaging this uh, outside edge. So um, while it's open I'm going to um, first start with a chisel and chisel out a rough 45 on each side and then I'll use the file to clean it up.
So I went ahead and finished the teak one off camera because as you can probably tell it started raining and I had to scramble to get my camera to safety. Okay so before I go ahead and sand and finish these things and make them look nice I think it's really important to first see whether these things are even going to produce a sound. Uh, to do that I'm going to have to drill the air holes or the blow holes in the India. I know that a lot of knowledge and expertise goes into actually making these things play and hopefully any changes that I'll need to make I'll be able to do from the outside as these things are obviously now glued up and taking them apart is going to be pretty much impossible. So let's do it. So I decided to drill these at an angle just so I could get those two mouth holes a little closer together which will hopefully make it a little bit easier to uh, blow into both of them at the same time. Okay, so this is the moment where I find out whether all of my work has been for nothing. I've got this little piece of scrap wood, I'm just going to put that over here as a block and see if it makes a sound. That's amazing, I'm so relieved right now. It's not sounding amazing, but it's doing something. Let me put a clamp on here so I can have my hands free. Okay, I'm not exactly sure what note that is. I'm just blowing out of the, the um, long chamber at the moment. Uh, but it seems that I have to blow really soft to maintain that low note. If I blow any harder, it seems to produce like an octave higher than um, the original note. Let's first try the right one on its own. Same thing, you have to blow really softly to maintain that low note. That sounds amazing. Uh, let's try both of them. That is awesome. I can't tell you how happy I am about that. Um, let's see. The other one is made exactly the same, so uh, technically it should uh, sound the same, so... Okay, so at least I think it's safe to say that um, I can carry on finishing these. Um, obviously there's a lot of work needed to be done in terms of uh, tuning this thing. I'm going to have to do a little bit more research and figure out what I can do to change the fact that it keeps going an octave higher if I blow a little harder. I know that if you blow really hard it goes an octave higher but um, I'm barely blowing at all at the moment so um, there must be something that I can do maybe enlarging these holes or maybe even enlarging the blow holes perhaps that'll make a difference. So I'm going to shape and sand these down and make them look nice. So let's get this done.
So currently I'm having a problem in that uh, I'm not getting this block to seat nicely over here. Plus, when I designed this, I didn't take into account the width between these two parts. The idea was that these two outside blocks would exactly cover the tracks, but as it stands now, this middle block is a bit wide. So these outside blocks are just barely covering the tracks. Also, the other problem I think I have is that I made the um, round over and the bevel a little too steep over here. So um, it's sounding very airy and I'm not really getting a good tone. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to chop these pieces off and then reshape all three of them together. I'm hoping that in doing that I'll still have enough um, space left to cover the air hole and still uh, butt up nicely with the sound holes. So I'm just going to keep on cutting and shaping until I get it to sound uh, half decent at least. Okay, I've been having a bit of issues with the shaping of these blocks and I realized that by cutting off these edges to match up with the middle one it doesn't leave me enough space to do the shaping that's necessary. So with the contrasting wood on each of them I've glued on an extra block and uh, once that's dry I'm going to go do the rest of the shaping. And honestly um, it's probably best if I do that off camera because that's going to be a little bit repetitive. I'm just going to be shaping it um, the same way that I did now. Right now I think what I should be doing is the one thing that I've been uh, putting off the whole time and that is starting to get these things in tune. <clears throat> While I was in my office I went ahead and used the tuner and checked the tuning of all of the tune holes on this flute. And so far I'm not far off. Okay, This is obviously upside down, you blow from that side and the air comes out this side. So the lowest hole is a G4 and the next one is A sharp 4 and the next one is C5 and the next one is D5 and the next one is F sharp 5. So basically the distance between them is fairly good already but I need to tune them all down a half step. So in order to tune these you first have to tune the lowest note by cutting off small pieces of the um, body until you get to the desired pitch. So I'm going to show you quickly where the pitch is at the moment and I'm going to cut off roughly uh, um, one centimeter or 10 millimeters and uh, see where we are then. So as you can see we've got a G on the right side, the flute side and the drone side is basically exactly the same. Um, as you can also see, if I blow it harder, you'll see it jump the octave like I've mentioned before. So then it jumps from G4 to G5. So as I said, I'm going to quickly cut off one centimeter and then we see what it looks like then. Okay, let's see where we are now. Okay, um, cutting off 10 centimeters went up by about 50 cents. So I'm going to cut off another centimeter and see uh, where we are then. Okay, seems like I was wrong. It's not a half step that I have to tune them up. I've got to tune them all up a full step. So as you can see now, I'm at uh, G sharp and I need to be at A. I'm going to um, cut off piece by piece until I get to the right pitch. Okay, so so far if I put the other one against it, it seems like I've cut off at least like uh, between three and four centimeters. And at the moment, as you can see, it looks like I'm about 20 cents shy. Let's try the drone chamber. Exactly the same. I'm not going to cut more off just yet. I'm worried that if I start tuning these holes that it's going to change this one. Now I've seen most of the people that tune these use a metal rod, something like this. I just quickly made this and apparently they heat it and enlarge the hole that way. So uh, let me get my torch, heat this up and start tuning these holes. So at the moment the second note is Second note is at B and we need to be at C. So I only need to go up one half step. So let me start burning out these holes and uh, see how it goes. So 
so while it's heating up i just want to mention i'm also going to um, burn out these blow holes over here while i was drilling them out because of the grain in the wood um, the drill bit wandered a bit to the left on both of them so i'm going to see if um, perhaps with the burning tool i can burn it out a little bit to the right and kind of recenter them Okay, so I've burnt out both of the blow holes. This is an 8mm rod and I've burnt it all the way through. So now I have 8mm holes where I did have initially 4 and then I put them up to 6 and now I have 8. As you can see my low note is still A. Second one is B and we need to go to C. So let's start. Wish me luck. It's gone up a bit, that's good. Almost there. So I need to go a little bit bigger. This one's also about 20 cents under, so I'm going to carry on tuning the rest of these. So I'm going to do the rest of this off camera because obviously this isn't a tuning tutorial. If you want to know how to tune your flute, there's a ton of other videos on Blue Bear flutes. Um, so go and check those out. So I'll come back when I'm at least closer than what I am now. Okay, so off camera, I went ahead and I did the exact same thing to the teak flute. Um, this one, I must say, was 10 times harder. This wood is so hard, it's almost impossible to get these holes burnt with uh, this metal rod that I was using. So I was skipping back and forth between the um, Dremel and the burning tool. So I'd take a bit out with the Dremel and then come and seal it off with the burning tool. And then every time I burn it, um, it chars the edge and that makes it easier for me to carve a bit more out with the Dremel. So uh, that took me quite a while, but uh, I wouldn't say it's 100% in tune, but it's definitely good enough to play with itself. I'm not going to be playing in bands or anything with these. This is just uh, for myself and it was just a test anyway. So. I'm obviously still getting that um, octave issue. The only thing that I can think of um, to hopefully fix that problem is to enlarge these sound holes as well as the air holes. Now, I was planning on doing all of this um, with the Dremel, but obviously for the holes I decided to go the traditional route and burn them out. But while I was doing this, I thought I may as well go ahead and make a tool to um, burn out the tracks and the air and sound holes as well. So um, that's exactly what I did. Just got to be careful, this thing is still hot. Um, I went ahead and I made a tool, and this um, is the tool that is used for burning out these holes and setting the um, bells on the inside and also leveling and sealing the track. Um, from what I understand, it's not 100% necessary, but um, Sealing it does um, stop it from absorbing moisture and gives it a much smoother surface. So um, I'm just going to wait for this end to cool down a bit and then I'm going to go ahead and burn out these holes and uh, burn the tracks as well. I've seen on a bunch of um, Blue Bear Flutes videos that um, he said if you enlarge the size of the sound holes your flute will most probably go a little bit flat so that means if my flute does go flat i'm going to have to go and tune each one of these up a tiny bit again so uh, i'm not looking forward to that but 
it is what it is. Hopefully that is going to um, give me a better sound. Okay, this is the moment where we're going to see if I have ruined everything or not. That's sounding a whole lot better. Now well, let's see how far the tune it is. actually seems to have gone sharper and not flat. So perhaps I should just uh, quit while I'm ahead and be happy with what I've got. Okay guys, so I've gone ahead and finished these things off camera as um, this video has definitely taken a whole lot longer than I expected it would. And I also have a number of paid jobs coming up that I really need to get started on. So all I basically did is I took these um, wool fed blocks that I made and using the Dremel and a whole lot of sandpaper, I shaped them into something that looks a little bit more aesthetically pleasing. So I basically went from this to this. Once I finished that, um, I went ahead and I re-sanded all of them and then I also went ahead and popped these into the laser machine behind me and engraved this uh, double wolf head logo as well as my channel logo and I'm really happy with how the engraving turned out. I think it looks really nice and sleek. So after that I went ahead and I finished it. Now I know traditionally most people finish this with um, oils or wax which kind of becomes something that you have to do on a regular basis to keep the wood from drying out. Now these are not things that I'm going to be playing every day so I went ahead and I finished them with a clear Rust-Oleum spray paint and I sanded with Scotch-Brite in between uh, every second or third coat and I must say it turned out really nice. I wish you could feel how smooth this wood is. Apart from that obviously I think it looks really nice and being that it's sealed with a spray paint it's never going to dry out so I won't have to reapply this finish um, in the future. Lastly, obviously I went ahead and I cut these uh, strips of leather from some offcuts that I have lying around, tied them up and I think it looks really nice. So I haven't had a whole lot of time to practice this instrument. My idea from the beginning of this video was to be able to record some nice tunes using this and then use that as some sort of backing music for the whole of this video. But as I said, I don't have a lot of time and I haven't gotten around to that yet. If I do manage to put something small together, um, I'll play that in the background um, for the rest of this video. So in conclusion, um, I think these things turned out really well. Initially in my mind, I thought um, this was going to be something that I could do mostly on the CNC with uh, minimal hand work but it ended up being totally the opposite. Um, in fact, I think the amount of work I did on the CNC might have only been like 20 to 30 percent and the rest was purely handwork. So any ideas that I uh, may have initially had of making and selling these, I think has gone uh, straight out the window. I think realistically, I'm just going to keep these in my ever-growing um, collection of things that I've made over the past couple of years. So if there's anyone out there who uh, might want to try and make one of these, I will make the vector files that I used uh, for the CNC cutting on this uh, available on my website for a small fee. And if you have any um, questions uh, specifically about uh, the making of this, you're welcome to drop them in the comments below. Um, I'm by no means an expert when it comes to this. Um, as I said earlier, um, everything I know about this thing I've basically learned in a week. So if any of you would like to build this and you're feeling hesitant and you're feeling um, like you don't have enough confidence, um, rest assured um, if I can 
discover this instrument, learn about it and build one in less than a week. I'm pretty sure you can too. Is it perfect? Uh, definitely not. Um, are there changes that I would make if I had to do it again? Most definitely. But for my first set of these flutes, I really think they um, look and sound really nice. This teak one specifically, I think sounds way better than um, this uh, pine one. For some reason, I just can't get this thing to sound really nice. But on the flip side, making this one was definitely at least twice as hard as making that one. So in my opinion, definitely if um, I were to make something like this, I would go and do a little bit more effort and use um, hardwood instead of softwood as I feel it just uh, makes a better instrument. But that's just my opinion and I'm pretty sure that uh, seasoned flute makers will most probably not agree. So with all that said, um, if you're still here, thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope you found it um, helpful and informative. If you did, then please go ahead and hit that like button. Um, share it with your friends. If you have any comments, drop them down below. And as always, till next time, keep making stuff.